Mr. Dumont, I'm uh, glad to have a few minutes to hang out with you. Appreciate your time. Oh, you're quite welcome. One of the things that's uh, intriguing to me is uh, this company that uh, has become very important in the industry and very successful um, and, and a long a long term company. I, I'd love to hear a little bit about how we got started. Well, you should have seen the way we got started. We were in a, an old house on Walnut Street, Philadelphia, 10th and Walnut. And it belonged to some kind of chemist. It was all big bottles and everything all over the place. I think the whole building, the whole floor we had was about 600 square feet. And we started there in December of 45. When my grandfather, he worked for E.B. Swisher, who was the jobber at the time, and a retailer also. And my uncle, who be, he went into the service, and when he came out, he, he worked there too. And then he decided that it was just foolish to keep working for somebody else to start our own business. Because my grandfather ran the Swisher wholesale business for him. So he said, why run it for somebody else when we could do it ourselves? And we moved around the corner and started. Mm. And uh, <laughs> it was really, it, it was a tough going then. Really? Because, well, see, everything is established. And when you have to establish something new, like, for instance, Swisher's the jobber, all of a sudden we say, we're the jobber. Well, it don't work that way. You know, everybody's used to Swisher, and we, it was quite a, quite a feat to start it. And what got us started, nobody wanted to give us credit in 45. And there was a, a man, Bernie Prager, Big Three Music Corporation. He was a good friend with my grandfather. And he, Big Three, opened us up with credit. And as soon as they did that, everybody else came in line. Like, for instance, they, it wasn't called uh, Warner Brothers, and it was called MPH, Music Publishers Holding Corporation. And they opened this up, and uh, all the, see, everybody, nobody had selling agents in those days. Everybody, if you had a song, you published it yourself. And it was all little publishers all over the place. And half of them, when we tried to get the music, they didn't even know who we were, because they knew Swisher. But anyway, my grandfather, he was a great guy. He, he was born in 1883, and he worked for Swisher for 49 years, you know. And he really knew the business in and out. And all the salesmen, that the, everybody had a salesman. They used to see him, not Swisher. So it was a little bit easier that way that when, when he did decide to open it up. It was my uncle and my grandfather. And I was 13 years old, and uh, when I... I'd say 13, 45 years, 13, used to come after school and run the errands for him. In town, Philadelphia, those days, had a lot of music dealers. Everybody covered cover music. Now there's nobody in Center City that I know of. But that's how we got started anyway, in this that's little quiet. tiny rinky-dink building. You know, and then, uh, I don't know how many years. We were there for a while, though. And uh, 74, we moved on to Arch Street, 13th and Arch. We were only there five or six years, and then we moved over to New Jersey. Mm. And uh, I guess 74, when we came in New Jersey, we were a little building on, uh, in a, an industrial park that had 7,500 square feet. And we had a salesman, Marty Morley-Wack. I was in morley Walk. And the Camelot chain was big at that time, when all the chains were big, Transamerica, everybody, uh, goodies, the whole thing. And uh, he got us the Camelot account. And we were on a 70, in a 7,500 square foot building, and I had happened just about two months before, made arrangements to move into a bigger building on what's called Springdale Road, which is the main road in Cherry Hill. And they thought we were too small in 7,500 feet, and we couldn't have gotten the account. But we took them over to show them our new building, and that sold them. <laughs> and that Camelot account is actually what got us started growing. Mm. It was a great account. The people there, Paul David, Jim Bonk, the salesman, and I had a fellow working for me then, George Biello. He was in Vietnam, and George uh, uh, Bonk, yeah, I guess it's George Bonk. No, it wasn't George Bonk. Anyway, his last name was Bonk, I know. And uh, they got together real good. And that just the, the whole relationship we had to, with them was great. 
That went on for quite a few years. But they're the ones that really helped us, you know, grow. And when you get a big account like that, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's like, maybe they did about $2 million a year with us. Mm -hmm. And for a little tiny outfit, that's a lot of, a lot of business. And then, uh, I guess after that, I, I always wanted to have my own building. I got tired of paying rent to people and have to do what they said. So I, this was an old golf course where we are now. Mm -hmm. And this was the 13th hole, I think. And it was for sale. They were selling off lots. And there was nothing here, no roads, no nothing. You had to come back by Jeep, four-wheel Jeep, to get to the place. And we built this building now. It's 36,000 square feet. And uh, from that time on, we just kept going, you know. It was great. It was a great ride, really. Now, did you guys ever have a retail store? Was it always... Well, we took care... When we were in Philadelphia, we sold retail, but we didn't encourage it. Like if they would come in, we would sell to them. Mm. But they, they, it wasn't any part of it. Our business was really wholesale. All the jobbers uh, throughout the, I guess, tri-state, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Mm. We very seldom went after that, anything out of our area. And uh, most of the time it was mail. United Parcel was there, but we didn't do too much. And then, then, then United Parcel kept getting bigger, and we kept getting bigger. So now most of the shipping we do is by United Parcel. Hmm. There's other ones around, but uh, every time we try to change or, or do something, we always come back to United Parcel. They, they, they do a great job. You know, everybody else talks a good game, but then we tried it, and it didn't work. So we're staunch U UPS. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you guys become Swisser um, competition? Well, in those days, there was a lot of competition. Walter Kane was in business, music dealer service, uh, and then the ones in, like, Cleveland, uh, I forget. You know, my this is a lot of years ago, and I start forgetting the names of these things, but there was a lot of competition then. Hmm. You know, Walter Kane was the biggest. I mean, he, and they Where were... were they from? Uh, they were in New York City. Oh, okay. And they were really good people. I mean, I can't not, they were our competition, but they were great people, mm. you know? And MDS, they were handled by, jeez, um, like I said, the name started, what the heck was his name? Anyway, he was a great guy. He was as funny as anything. He was your competition, but you got along good with him, you laughed with him, and you had fun with him, mm. you know? And it was a different, different kind of business back then. People were actually nice people. The salesman, you know, I knew, like one of the uh, salesmen, Carl Zorns, who used to be Mark's music. He was a great guy. Mm. And he knew there was a, 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 in Greens 5 and 10, Mae Morgan, Russ Morgan's sister, the band leader of Russ Morgan. She was a great friend of ours. Yeah. You know, it was, that's for 5 and 10, the Greens, Grants 5 and 10, I think it was called. Cool. And then we just, in fact, that's how I met my wife. My wife passed away eight years ago, but she was the, uh, at the toy counter of this Kresge store, and there was a counter, of course, to the music counter. They used to be song pluggers in those days. They had the piano. If you wanted a new song, she would play it for you. And I used to deliver there, and I met my wife across the counter, and we got finally got married <laughs> back in 53. We were married 46 years before she died. Wow. But... Um, I tell you, people were different. That's the whole thing you got. And then in a nutshell, people, even though they're nice people today, they were great people years ago. I mean, really great. I mean, you, you, you like knowing them. They, they just were fun, you know? <laughs> That's uh, really neat. Tell me a little bit about your grandfather. What sort of guy was he? Well, he was, he was born in 1883, like I said, and he worked for Swisher for 49 years. And he knew this business in and out. And all the salesmen that came in knew him. It was, in those days, they wore the coats, you know, them, what are they, the dust cover type coats all the time. Were open on Saturdays. And Swisher was the kind of guy that, he wouldn't pay him until Saturday night, the last day of the week, and as long as he could take. And it used to be tough getting along that way. But he worked for him. I'm telling you. He, and my uncle worked with him. That's how we got the basis of starting. 
and I don't think Swish is around anymore because I don't, I don't, I don't think so. His this his uncle. I don't think it was his father. I think it was his uncle started the business that I knew, mm. E. B. Swisher. But uh, my grandfather knew everybody, got along with everybody, and uh, he just knew every publisher that ever existed. Every song that was, he had it all in his head. Mm. He used to have a desk. It was like a podium, and he at those times they were like penny postcards or two cent postcards, and he used to have all postcards in his desk. And as he, we ran out of something, he would write it on the postcard. When the postcard got filled, it got sent off as an order. You know, it wasn't done by phones or anything like that. Yeah. And the salesman used to call on us. Like I said, I. I even when I, I think about it, it's so different years ago. Mm. Really, the business was so different. No, I noticed that you... Oh, please. I was just going to say, songs were 35 cents a piece, three for a dollar. That's how you sold cheap music at that time. Wow. Like 35 cents, we used to buy it at 18 cents and sell it for 21 cents. We made like three or four, then it's maybe 22, four cents a copy. So you didn't really get rich in this business, you know? Mm. <laughs> now everything that used to be when books came out selling for 75 cents to down 1995 ridiculous the same books there's no more the copyrights have run out there's no more uh, the only thing that cost them is the print and yet they're 1995 which uh, to me it sounds ridiculous nowadays it is not but you know money was worth a whole lot more back then has the product line changed since the beginning? Well, most of the time, sheet music doesn't sell as well. The popular sheet music doesn't sell as well as it used to. Was, everybody used to want sheet music and play it. Now you buy a book and it's got anything you can need in it. And uh, a lot of them don't even know how to play it. They just buy it for the um, the, uh, the sheet music for the covers, mm. you know, and all. But uh, years ago, like I said, they were only 35 cents a piece. <laughs> I mean, anybody could afford that. Yeah. And did you guys carry anything other than sheet music? <laughs> well, we started, again, it was tough. It was right after the war. Instruments were hard to come by. So we would buy up used instruments, drums. The top shells were always drums and mostly drums and uh, some brass instruments like trumpets and all that. And uh, when they used to go, my uncle used to go out as sales calls all over Philadelphia, and he would try and sell them these used drums and the trumpets, and so, just to make a buck. Yeah. I mean, you had to make a dollar any way you could, because uh, you know you didn't make much money. I mean, but uh, yeah, he used to go out there. My grandfather used to call on. We used to deliver to people by the subway. <laughs> we didn't have cars. I mean, he used to take like it was a big account in 69th Street. Well, he would go from Center City, deliver out to 69th Street, and then take the L all the way back up to the Northeast where he lived. And then on the way, he'd get off at Bridge Street and deliver to another comp uh, customer there. Mm. And he, they did anything to stay in business, to get started. And like I said, it was really tough because uh, you know, everybody was used to one way of doing it, and then we come along and say, well, do it with us. And it's just like, well, who are you? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but my grandfather did have a lot of friends. Mm. I mean, if it wasn't for him, we would never, ever have started. What was his name? His name, he was very secretive about his past, too. Oh, really? They, my family came from France. And his father was the head chef at the Philadelphia Cricket Club. And that's the only thing I know about him. His name was Francois. And like I said, I don't know, my grandfather was born in this country, but I know his father and his mother came in around the 1850s from France. Hmm. And he had a brother, Frank Dumont. He was a, a, in vaudeville, he was a sword swallower. <laughs> I got pictures of him around. You see the things that he used to do, magician, sword swallower. And, um, but as far as, I, I just could never, get him to talk about his family. And something must have happened mm. that really, you know how you get these mental blocks 
and he never talked about his family. So I don't know that much about him. I know about my grandmother. His wife married her and she was born in 1890, so I guess he, they were, people married young then. So I guess they got married in around 1910, about that, 10, 15, not even, no, had to be before that because my father was born in 1912. So I guess they were married in 19, about 10, 9, oh, you know, 1909 or something like that. But I know her family history, but I know my grandfather's. That's yeah, that's amazing. And me and him were great. I used to live in South Philly, and, and uh, every Saturday night I would take the trolley car up and meet him at work. He worked till 6. And we would go up to Chinatown and have Chinese food. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, my grandfather was a great guy. He really, I mean, I don't know of anybody that ever disliked him. And he had friends all over the place, even down to the place where you had lunch. You know, they, they, he was a good guy. Yeah. That's neat. I'm proud of him, really. Really am. And I was really, really close to my grandfather. How long did he live? Well, he died when he was 75. That was back in 59. It's funny, my grandmother and grandfather died on the same day. It was Easter Sunday of, uh, of 59. She was going to...